Welcome to Hyperfocus Hour, a podcast that is dedicated to ADHD and neurodiversity in the workplace, where myself and wonderful people such as you, Gabriel, uh, attempt to navigate and build tools for neurodivergent people in tech and cybersecurity to essentially help them build and succeed in their career. I'm John. I'm a cybersecurity recruitment consultant. I've got a year and a half of experience in security operations and digital forensics incident response. Uh, I have ADHD, primarily inattentive. I have two diagnoses from the US and a third from the United Kingdom. Uh, this podcast is now going to be brought to you by myself, obviously, and via resource, a specialist information and security uh, recruitment specialist who operate in the UK, Europe, US and Middle East, which I realize is quite a lot. Today, we have Gabriel Severi uh, as a guest on the show. Gabriel is a security engineer and who, like me, obviously has ADHD. Gabriel has extensive experience in the security industry, and I'm really excited to be talking to you, Gabriel, uh, about the economic impact of neurodiversity and management. So welcome to Hyperfocus Hour. And again, I'm really, really excited to be talking about neurodiversity and management in the workplace and how that can impact the economy. But before we get started, I have one question for you. Sure, fire ahead. Do you know, do you know what ADHD tax is? Have you heard that phrase? Yes. I, I absolutely have uh, the extra amount of time that it takes us to do anything. That means uh, we're we're often paying for for the amount of time that we spend on doing something that neurotypical people do a lot faster. Yeah, or or like we bought something and we've forgotten we bought it or whatever. Yes. So before we get yes. started, my the question, impulsiveness of buying yes. things without <laughs> the planning. Impulsiveness. Yep. So, or forgetting to pay for something early when you get a discount, but then ending up paying for it late. Yeah, and you pay the full price. So whether whether it was today, yesterday, in the last week, what had, what was your most recent ADHD tax? Oh dear, I'm lucky for on that front that uh, as soon as I identified issues like that, I tried to put <laughs> structures in place to prevent me from doing that. I just mm. make it a default rule, for example, for me, I don't buy things unless it's 100% pre-planned. Yeah. Um, if I'm out, I'm in a shopping mall, or if I'm you know, traveling, if I haven't mm. planned to buy something, it's a flat rule. Even if I need it, even if I like it and I want it, I'm you just like, buy it. nope. That's Until, a lot of self constraint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you haven't had a tax like that in a while. Thankfully, it has happened and it's bit me hard. So I've had to. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things, you know, it takes a number of times for it to bite you, but you learn. Yeah. 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 I've, I had a, I had a tax uh, recently. Um, that was probably about a month or two ago. Uh, basically, I bought a. I, I really like Lego, especially as it pertains to the Star Wars, right? Yeah. And I bought a. Um, basically, I bought a, a Lego Star Wars set, and I forgot that I bought it. About a week ago, it showed up in my flat, and I was like, "Oh, I have new Star Wars. I have I have new, I have new Lego sets. Cool. I completely forgot. Absolutely, totally forgotten." And then I was like, "This is my Saturday sorted. I can now have a fun day." That is beautiful. It's like a present to yourself from your past self. Yeah, that's that's how I look at it now. I'm just like, if something like that happens, uh, I I bought uh, I bought some some seasoning that I needed to, uh, to make like a curry and like a fried rice and stuff, and it showed up on I think Saturday. It, same thing. Showed up and I was like, what is this? And I opened it. I was like, oh, that's what it was. Just yeah, no, completely that, that does happen uh, yeah. every once in a while. The longer it takes for things to get dispatched, I. Uh, I recently bought a um, a present for my fiance. Uh, well, I'm really saying recently. I, I before Christmas, mm. I bought a present for my fiance's birthday, which is coming up in August. Yeah. Um, sorry, apologies. It's not in August. <laughs> August is my mother. See, there's a your ADHD again. There it is. Yeah. Hers is in October. Uh, so I I know it's a long time in advance, but I knew it was a pre-order. Yeah, so I knew that it would take some time for it to get dispatched and eventually it did get dispatched and it arrived uh, last week. 
and uh, it's related to a game. I, I don't know if, if you like gaming. Uh, it's Destiny Tears of the Kingdom. Is, oh, Tears of the Kingdom is beautiful. I'm it's currently on Destiny 2. No. Oh. And there's this beautiful cybernetic dog mm. that you get to pet in the game. And she <laughs> right. loves animals. So And she loves plushies. Um, so a couple of years ago, I bought her a uh, Five Nights at Freddy's plushie. So mm. this time around, I thought I'd get this uh, pettable cybernetic dog as a plushie. And it arrived. When it, exactly as you said, when it arrived, I was like, what's this? I wasn't expecting anything. And then I was like, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was an oh moment, yes. Yeah, the oh moment is a the oh moment is a great moment because you're like, all right, I forgot I did that. It's a really yeah. good it's it's a good feeling and it's also like a how could I have forgotten that? But it's it's I think when it's you fun. got an email reminding you three days before you arrived. Yeah, and you didn't <laughs> you, you didn't read the email because you're like, nah, it can't nope. be that important. Yeah. Yep. So ADHD so, tax right there, not reading emails that you're supposed to. And speaking of that, like ADHD tax, not reading emails when you're supposed to, that goes into this into our conversation today. Neurodiversity, ADHD, management, and the economics of it. So this is a really interesting topic. And it's a topic that I, I don't think I've really had uh, anyone else kind of speak about. What attracted you to it? Like, wh where, where did your interest grow from this? What, what caused you to think about it? Sure. Uh, I, you know, I, I work in cybersecurity and I've got ADHD, so it's no mm -hmm. surprise to anyone that I like maths and mathematics. So um, anything mathy, anything numbers, anything that you can calculate and measure has attracted me for forever, basically physics, mm -hmm. quantum physics, chemistry. So that, that's always been an area of interest of mine. But sometimes there's a topic in the media that that sort of pulls up and you're like, I've got some knowledge about this that mm -hmm. that sound that, that feels significant. Um, and I had been recently doing some work on game theory, um, trying to understand it better and trying mm -hmm. to see how it applies in different scenarios, but particularly evolution and economics. So there's two branches of game theory, uh, evolutionary game theory and economical game theory. Are we talking about video can... game theory here? Mm. Almost. So game theory is a scientific theory of interaction and decision making. Okay. So because games fall under that category, uh, it, it's called game theory. So essentially, if you have a rules of interaction, mm -hmm. that is the rules of the game. And then you have an outcome or an objective, right? Yeah. Um, and that is the aim of the game. And then you have the participants they're the players. So you can describe games through game theory, so mm. like a game like chess, or you can describe any strategical interaction with the same theory. Right. So hence why, you know, let's say evolutionary competition started being described in terms of game theory, um, because it's two competing participants, mm -hmm. for example uh in a two you know two player interaction um yeah. could be multiplayer interaction could be team based like a sport like football that can be described in game theory but each team is a unit of participation so yeah. you wouldn't consider each individual player as a player you consider the team as a player as a player okay yes. and so so from following you then Game theory translates into neurodivergence and the economics of management and stuff because you're not thinking of the managers maybe individually, but as a company or as a uh, or even what's it like um, different kind of verticals like finance or uh, like insurance uh, or consultancy. Well, there's an entire branch. branch. There's an entire branch of game theory called economics game theory. Okay. Um, and, and because of my interest in game theory, I started getting interested in economics mm -hmm. and how the strategies and choices of uh, actors in the market mm -hmm. impact the market and each other. Because uh, mm -hmm. companies are constantly competing against each other, trying to do better than each other, uh, etc. And you know, you can even compare. Uh, there's there's a, a word that we use in business called incorporated. 
So mm -hmm. incorporated comes from the Latin corpus, which means body. So you can make a parallel between a business entity, a corporation, yeah. with the body. So the executive management is your brain. The uh, departments are like each individual organ. Each individual employee is a cell and money okay, so, is the energy. So it really breaks down, okay. It maps very well. It maps perfectly, in fact. Yeah. Um, there's a reason they called it incorporated at, at the end of the day. Yeah, um, and, and what you get is once, because I have that interest already, and now a hot topic is this idea of stagflation, mm -hmm. right? So you have stagnation, so lack of productivity and inflation. So yeah. where market prices are going up, despite us not producing more. Yeah. Um, and you get this, you, you get COVID and everybody's now working from home and you've got all the subsidies being given out, which is making inflation even worse. Yeah. And you've got issue of being capable now of working from home, but once COVID is out, some companies are pushing people back into the office. And, yeah. and that caught my eye, that caught my interest. Cause I was like, I think I can model this through game theory. But um, after doing the modeling, the, the, and this is like not, nothing extensively mathematical, uh, but uh, it's just mainly logic. So, so my, my area mainly focuses on, on logic uh, diagrams and, and logic out, logical outcomes. Um, and what you tend, what I identified was something that I had pr somewhat presumed or observed, but then I was capable of modeling it at a larger scale. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, in my own, in the businesses I have worked in, you notice the behavior and you can predict this will lead this behavior or this strategy, this choice will lead to these outcome. Yeah. Or given a certain set of circumstances, these will be the outcome. And, and was I it was that, capable of these. So sorry, was it at ahead. that point? Yeah. Was it at that point that when you were, you were doing this modeling and you, you were running it through game theory and everything, was it at that point you kind of maybe, w w did you notice there was a trend in like neurotypical managers and a lack of neurodiverse managers? What, what was kind sure. of the, what was the trend there? So for sure. So, um, one of the, so the, I'm going to start uh, like this. So, so the, there were, if I remember correctly, two main trends, um, potentially three, but one main trend is, I'm going to use a technical term, but uh, I will try to explain it as best as I can. Okay. Uh, during bull markets, you have yeah. extreme inefficiency. So what that means is a bull market is when the market is doing financially very well or ex even exceeding expectations. And what ends up happening is in periods of abundance, inefficiency can be masked uh, yeah. by simply applying more resources. So you have a manager that isn't particularly smart or isn't particularly good at strategizing or mm -hmm. managing people. Or and engaging. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then what happens is they, in order to solve the lack of productivity that his team is having, they say to their, their manager, the senior management, I need more employees. I need a bigger team, mm -hmm. right? We're not producing enough because we don't have the resources. It's always a resources problem. Yeah. You've seen that picture where this guy trying to look over a wall has about 15 ladders, but they're stacked horizontally. Whereas right. if you used a single ladder stacked vertically on the wall, you'd be able to get over the wall. So essentially, instead of using the ladder uh, the way that the ladder should be used, they're just mismanaging it. They're mismanaging resources yeah. uh, because they're inefficient. They're not uh, good strategists. And what ends up happening is in a period, in a bull market condition, that is fine. You yeah. can throw more resources at the problem. Let's stack some more ladders, stack some more ladders horizontally. horizontally, yeah. Because we can afford it. 
Yeah. Uh, and you see that's exactly what happened with Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and all of these large yeah. tech companies that are now doing mass layoffs. Yeah. Why are they doing mass layoffs? During a bull market, they overhired. Yeah. They just threw resources at a problem when the correct solution would have been, let's find a more efficient way. Yeah. So, so that is the first trend, right? And, and we're seeing that now. So as soon as a bull market ends and you start going into recession, yeah, the inefficiencies of management start becoming no critically apparent. apparent. Yeah. Um, the second thing I started noticing is because of poor management, promotions were also and hiring was also inefficient. Mm -hmm. um, and by that, I mean, they were more socially oriented to make people happy yeah. rather than measured on a capacity and skill basis. Right. So what that means is you've been at the job for 10 years, uh, you're best friends with your executive and you get promoted to becoming a director. Yeah. You're not being promoted right. by competency or your actual skills. You're being promoted by nepotism might be a good word. Uh, yeah, might, it's who you might, know. Yeah, it's who you know. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's something that just. Uh, or just who you can make everybody. happy. Yeah. Or who you can make happy, right? So yeah. if you can make somebody happy that has the power to promote you, your likelihood of being promoted goes up significantly. Yeah. And that. What ended up happening there is you can see it now, the evidence is in the job market. Whenever you're looking for a, a role to apply to, and it yeah. says you need these many years of experience. Yeah. How does the years of experience correlate to capacity to do that job? Yeah. It, yeah. Know, it, it may or it may not. It could be a close approximation to, but in isolation, it is not much. Yeah, and then if I if I'm if I'm following with where you're going, I, I'm I'm thinking your your third point. Uh, if we bring it back to, to, to ADHD or neurodiversity, the third sure. point if I'm following is the, the the people that are getting hired or they're getting promoted, um, the the nepotism, if you will, that's being given to other neurotypical people. Uh, maybe a lot of the time because they are the ones that make the the higher ups. They make the senior that they make the seniors happy they get on with them they have those connections they have whereas, that social ability that social awareness yeah whereas neurodivergent yeah. people we struggle a little bit more with the social aspects uh not even to get into the fact that we often don't stay at jobs as long as uh, as a neurotypical does so then it cascades because there are probably some uh, definitely some really good neurodivergent people out there that would be better suited for these roles and are being passed up because they maybe are a bit too blunt or they just they just think differently and the the seniors thinking well, they don't think there the isn't yeah. there isn't a worse experience of going to an interview where the candidate is more cap capable of the job than the hiring manager yeah and because they're speaking completely different languages the hiring manager can't identify it yeah and that's the problem that I'm talking about here is primarily one where managers that have been promoted into management inappropriately yeah. then are compounding the problem by making hiring decisions that are inappropriate. Now, yeah. when it comes to um, neurodiversity, that can that is affected usually in two ways. So on one hand, where the neurodiverse candidate is the one applying or the one that would like a promotion mm -hmm. uh, is the employee yeah right the subordinate let's say then bad management essentially means that they don't get the reasonable adjustments that they need yeah it may mean that their true capacity to perform is not assessed correctly um right. So, so because it's being assessed in, on neurotypical standards. Yeah, no, not not just neurotypical standards. They're just bad managers. Don't know how to assess even neurotypicals. So, some brilliantly talented neurotypicals are being passed over 
because a bad manager does not have the right metrics to right. measure capacity. So it's not limited to one or the other. It's not a us versus them. It's a bad managers are gonna bad manage. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, whether the candidate is uh, a neurotypical or not. Now, yeah. then it, you can flip it and say, what happens when it's a neurodiverse person that is the manager, mm. right? And then you start getting into a whole other scale of problems. And I've identified this particularly in the tech sector. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's no surprise. There's a, a lot of, you know, psychological research, uh, scientific research that have quantified what percentage of tech employees have a neurodiversity of some sort, whether it be autism, ADHD, dyslexia, you name it, it is incredibly high, right? I don't have the number right in front of me, but uh, it is a known, a known fact. Um, yeah. We are really good engineers. We're really good analysts. And really that means technical that we workers, yeah. Good technical workers. We outperform, yeah. which means we might stay in the job longer than a neurotypical peer. Yeah. So because we've been there longer, we've been there 10 years in that company, and we've made friends with the executive, you know, despite our neurodivergency, then you get promoted despite yeah. not being capable of being a manager. Yeah. And we're not having you, adequate training. It, it compounds the problem because now yeah. not only are you a bad manager, you're a bad manager with a neurodiversity. <laughs> yeah. Right. So not only you're a bad manager, you're a bad manager with a neurodiversity and you know, I'm sure we're, we're going to talk about this some more, but the, the lack, as you said, the lack of training and preparation for these neurodiverse managers is really starting to bite uh, these yeah. companies in, in the rear end because the, particularly the tech industry and, and sa the cybersecurity industry, even more so mm -hmm. is starting to severely suffer from the l poor management and that's yeah. what's uh, in my estimation what's causing the prices and cost of uh salaries yeah to, to raise and, and we can discuss that in more detail uh if you'd like yeah yeah i well that's the thing is i, I as you were speaking i was thinking about this and i had a um i i uh, at a previous company i had a manager uh neurotypical and uh, obviously I have ADHD. I'm primarily an attentive, right? Um, one of my coworkers uh, is primarily hyper, w w one of my coworkers was primarily hyperactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, this manager knew a little bit about ADHD and they'd come up with a really good way and solution to manage my coworker. So they then took that management style and uh, I, don't, I don't know if impose is the right word, but they used, that management style on yes. the as a fellow ADHD -er on me. The Bait them all with one brush. But the problem was, and I didn't realize this at the time, which is a shame because if I had, uh, I think uh, things would have changed, would have would have worked out quite differently. I probably would have ended up staying there. But it's only with hindsight, obviously, because it's 2020. Um, that management style, because it was focused for a hyperactive person, was actually horrible for me. Uh, it led to micromanagement. It led to undue stress. Uh, I, I wasn't delivering the way that I needed to. Uh, miscommunications, yes. lack of communication, and I, I slowly and that realized. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I slowly realized. Well, it, it's not. It's not that he was a bad manager. They, this this guy was not a bad man. Uh, I actually think he's a he, he's a great manager. The problem was he was managing me like he was managing uh, someone else when it was a totally different type of ADHD because of the lack of awareness on the different types of ADHD and neurodivergence. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to contradict you there for a moment, but I do think it's bad management and mm. maybe it's not intentional. They were not an evil person by any means. No. Bad, so I'm just going to term it as management is a skill. You know, just yeah. because somebody is a bad footballer does not mean, oh, you know, they, they are a bad person. Yeah. And lack yeah, of training. Yeah, I wasn't saying he's a bad person. By no means. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So bad in this sense, not 
in the moral sense, but mm -hmm. certainly in the lacking skill sense, which is often what we've been finding in, in you know, as a result of the bull market. Yeah. These people that have bad management skills yeah. being promoted and rewarded despite. Yeah. And now, I mean, now because of the bull market, it's going to recession or what, what would you call it? A bear market? Um, so that's the flip end or I don't know. Yeah, that's I right. believe that's right. A bear, a yeah. bear market is a cold market that things yeah. start slumping down. And so now that we're in that that's market, the hump. you know, now that we're in that market, we've been seeing uh, just wage inflation, especially in cybersecurity. Uh, when I was, when I started a year and a half ago, a, uh, what was it a security architect would be looking realistically was looking for about maybe 80 maybe 90 uh on k on average on a base uh for really good company really good security architect they'd be looking for like 100 right yeah. it's absolutely changed now the the, the 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 price has gone up by 20 percent. so now the same the same person with the same experience for the same kind of job everything is looking for like 120 130 k yes. and what's happened is you have a lot of these people who come from Meta or um, you know Amazon, uh, the, the the big ones. I'm not going to name some of the smaller ones um, because GDPR. Yes. <laughs> but they they come and they have these overinflated egos of oh I I'm worth 120k I'm worth 150k and I'm like, but that's not what the market's saying. The only reason you have the that you can say that you are worth that is because of the wage inflation that we've had because of the of the of the kind of microcosm or the bubble that security is in that's now starting to pop and you have both no, and i think it is I it is totally not disagree. popping I, so, I think it is so here's why it's not popping um the it is what you're going to end up with is a um a classification right a crystallization of haves and have nots in cybersecurity. Mm. And what that means is essentially is at the top end of the market, prices are going to keep rising. Yeah. Whereas at the bottom end of the market, prices are going to drop. And the reason prices mm. are going to drop is because more people that believe they're worth 120, right? Mm -hmm are not going to be able to get those roles at 120 and they're going to start going for roles at 100 yeah at 80 and and it's going to start slowly trickling down to those levels uh then but the thing you will find is they will not be doing the same role that is no. worth 120 they're going to start looking for roles such as analysts or engineering roles that are now worth 70. So they're going to start doing roles that they might, in theory, in theory, right? Because hmm. when, when somebody is hired because they've got good charisma rather than because they've got good you know, capabilities, yeah, they might end up with experience in a role that they're not capable of. So <laughs> uh, I want to, I want to, you know, preface it with that. But they're going to end up in a role that they are over experienced for. Yeah, but paid an inflated wage there, um, or maybe in a role that they think they're over experienced for, but in reality correct. they got lucky with a role that they didn't have enough experience for, and now they're actually in a role that is actually suited for where they're at in their career correct and what that's going to do is that's going to dry up the experienced market mm. the more these people start dropping down to lower wage roles the more companies are going to be competing for that senior architect the more companies are going to be competing for that security manager yeah right uh, or senior engineer senior analyst there's going to be a lot of competition because people are the companies are unreasonable and, and I was going to use this, uh, you know, going to these detail. Uh, so I'm going to actually take the moment and, and do that now. So here's how the inflation generally is occurring, right? And, and this is across the board, not just in, in technology or cybersecurity, but mm -hmm. it's particularly, uh, strong. This effect is particularly strong in cybersecurity. A bad manager that is incapable of assessing capability during interview. Yeah, might be overly selective. 
yeah right? yeah or might be more likely to dismiss an employee they don't like despite that employee being capable of the job yeah so when an employer a hiring manager is being highly selective with the candidates that they want to hire they're choosing from a smaller pool of yeah. candidates yeah supply demand rules right when yeah. the supply is lower and the demand is higher that smaller pool of candidates are going to be yeah. competed over on the basis of uh salary so well, i mean we're saying, we're, we're saying the same thing with uh with hybrid working remote working uh yes. the, the, the amount of people that are are wanting to work remote let's say fully remote the amount of people that are wanting to work fully remote ha hasn't decreased uh if anything it's increased but because of the market that we're in and companies are like oh no we actually have more power than we did a couple of years ago during COVID. yes they're now going uh oh we're going to do two or three days a week in the office there's a couple of companies i know that are doing they actually do five days a week in the office for security analysts and engineers we guys mm -hmm. don't need to be in the office you you can work from home just as easily but what's but happening then they're is, having to pay the big bucks for them because it's a small pool of candidates yeah but at the same time the hybrid and remote roles, the their salaries, are, those salaries are actually starting to, to dwindle a little bit because Correct. those companies know that they don't have to be paying extortionate prices uh, to find a, a broader pool of candidates. Correct. And people are willing to go to those jobs despite being a lower salary. And, oh, yeah. and, and that is very true. And that's what you're going to find. So the lower the supply, the lower the candidate pool, the higher the, the salary range mm. is going to go. And the more selective or picky an employer or hiring manager is due to being a bad manager, mm. the higher you'll see wage inflation go, right? Um, simply because of that effect. Yeah. But then that causes a feedback loop that I've been noticing in the last two years, particularly, mm -hmm. right? So this is really, really bad uh, feedback loop. Consider, I'm going to use an analogy to sort of, sort of show how stu stupid, really, mm -hmm. this mentality is that is happening in the hiring market. Um, so let's say a um, bananas are scarce at the moment due to lack of rainfall. So mm -hmm. their price has suddenly shot up, right? So the, there's a low supply high demand, price of bananas increase. Sure. People going to the supermarket go, oh my days, it's increased so much. Uh, you know, for that price, I want a really good banana, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not going to get these crappy bananas over here. I want the really good banana that's actually worth that through price. The, yeah, you're going to sift through the bunch to find the best one you possibly can. For that price, exactly. And yeah. then, then what, what you end up happening is that's the price of the banana that year you're not going to find anything better because that's what you get. Yeah. Right. That That's how supply and demand works. You might be lucky and find one good banana in, in a bunch of bad bananas, yeah. but it, you know, it's luck more than the way it, things work. Yeah. It's more you luck in finding the good banana than it is skill in being able to spot the good banana. Exactly. Mm. So I see where you're going. You know, so, so the, the idea there is you're, you've got to pay the price of the banana at where it's at, because uh, that's yeah. how the market works, right? Uh, if you think a, a produce is currently in a good deal, you buy it early yeah. so that it appreciates. That's how the stock market works. If yeah. a company's shares are undervalued, you want to buy them so that when they grow yeah. to the value they're supposed to be yeah you you've made money um but you well, don't I've want to done, buy I've them i've done that with like i've done that with uh with my lego i'm going to use another lego example yeah uh, go ahead uh, lego normally a most a lot of lego sets especially star wars lego sets uh, appreciate with value but that only happens when the set is retired so i have mm -hmm. a uh i have the big uh 2019 um UCS Ultimate Collector Series Star Destroyer. Thing sent me back probably about 600 pounds. Now, if I had kept it in the box and not opened the box, 
you know, just sealed factory everything. I could now sell that on eBay or whatever for, oh gosh, I, I think I saw it for about two, about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds uh, just because mm. the supply is now gone, but the exactly. desire for it hasn't left. And it's the same thing exactly. with a lot. It's the same thing with a lot of the other Lego sets that I buy. I buy them not because I, I want them or even because I like them. I buy them. I put them in my cupboard. And I'm thinking, okay, two or three years, this will be worth, you know, let's say it's a 50 pound set. A couple of years, that set's going to be worth 200, 300, maybe even 400 pounds. Not even and how, how imagine things. how stupid then it would be if somebody looked at you, knew that you owned that thing, and went was like, "I'm willing to pay you forty bucks for it." Yeah, I'd be like, "No, you're an idiot. I, I, that's that's less than I paid." Exactly. So that's what's happening in the job market. Mm. So what ends up happening in the job market is the hiring managers start becoming more picky because they're bad managers. So they hire somebody that is clearly bad for the job. Sure. And doesn't turn out well, they get fired. Then they hire somebody else. They're clearly bad for the job, so they get fired. So the manager starts thinking, I need somebody with more experience. I need somebody more skilled. Mm. So the manager goes, because they're incapable of finding the right person, they start thinking it's an experience issue. So they start looking for more experienced more candidates. More people, yeah. But they want those at the price yeah. of the junior. So this is a junior role. So my question, <laughs> my question then comes to you uh for for adhd people for neurodiverse people how how does this impact them where where do, where's the impact for neurodiverse people it's the same impact as you get for neurotypicals but uh we struggle more let's say depending on what type of neurodiversity you have might struggle more at interviews mm -hmm. you know uh, when you consider that luck in finding the, the the beautiful banana in a bunch of bad bananas uh, is that idea of you know trying to find a talented candidate that is undervalued yeah willing to accept a low salary but a you've got to new... find you've got to find that candidate as well that um because we'll, we'll use adhd as an example right mm. um a lot of, i cannot tell you how bad i am at uh, taking written exams i'm horrible at it now, it's not because I don't know the stuff. I, I When I take a written exam, I know the stuff. It's in my head. The problem mm -hmm. is sometimes I need a little bit of, a, uh, of like a kickstart or maybe a no. It, it, and it could be one word. It could be, uh, I don't know. Let's I call it the seed. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. You need a seed to grow that tree. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that I don't know it. It just means, um, well, okay, if I, if I was to do a lecture on... Uh, why the galactic empire fell in star wars <laughs> right it's I, I love star wars we, everybody knows that i get anybody that anybody that has seen my my linkedin posts or has talked to me or anything they, they know i love star wars right but here's the thing if i was going to give a lecture on why the, the galactic empire fell now i could tell you why that is but if i were to get up in front of 500 people i would probably start waffling because i'm yes. I, I i know the stuff but i can't quite get to it you're so nervous, what do I do? And you can't focus on yeah. where to start. So so yeah. what do I what do I do to to kickstart or get the, the, what do I do for that seed? I have a, a note card or a piece of paper that has key words at different points in that talk to literally give my brain that little boost. Now when we go over to uh, when we go over to cybersecurity or just interviewing in general, what happens to ADHD people? It's the exact same thing. If I were to ask you a highly technical question on a topic about engineering that you haven't touched in six months. Now, I, I know that you will know the answer because you've done it. And I know that you know the answer. I know that you've done it because it's on your CV and we've talked about it before. But if I were to ask you right now, there's a high chance, there's a high probability that you'd be like, it's there, but you can't quite get to it. So then what happens? This manager, has found their banana. They found their excellent banana. They're, they're one in a million, right? But because of the way the interview process is built, uh, or because of the way that they, they are managing, recognize it. they don't recognize it. So they might have the, the yeah. fantastic banana that is under budget, that's available immediately, that uh, doesn't have any blemishes or any whatever the hell bananas have. It's the perfect let's banana. It, let's call it a bruised banana. Sometimes yeah. you will find 
and, and this is this is really beautiful example. That's why I like using bananas. Mm. My father, uh, I, you can tell from my accent, I'm I'm from Brazil, um, sure. and my father absolutely loves bananas. I Me, mean, I do too, but he particularly loves them, and he can tell a good banana from a bad banana from right. really really quickly. And a lot of people make this mistake. They want the banana without any spots whatsoever. Yeah. Right. That banana is going to be, was picked too green yep. and it's not going to be sweet. Yeah. It might be a little, a little bit sharp. If you get a banana that's got some blemishes, some of the yeah. purple or some of the black, you know, on, on the skin, but then you peel it, you're going to find that it's actually not penetrated into yeah. the actual banana. It's just surface deep, right? It's just yeah. skin deep. But that banana was picked at the right time and it's the sweetest banana you will ever taste. It, so, yeah, it's a ripened banana, it's perfect. Here's what you get. Mm. You get a bad manager that can't tell what a ripened banana is. Yeah. So then like, back, to that, back to the question, like if we take that into mind with ADHD people, a bad manager doesn't like maybe they, they they don't know what they're looking for so they hire the wrong people how how are we how does this negatively impact people such as ourselves how does it negatively impact and how then can we change that process the, the this economics of management if you will to to give if we can or help boost neurodivergent people in getting the roles that they would actually probably be good for and would be would miss otherwise. Sure, I'll, I will get to that. Um, what I'm going to do first is just conclude the mechanics of how the, the feedback loop occurs. And on the back of that, I will start uh, providing some some solutions. Sure. Uh, so essentially what happens is once those managers that can't find a good candidate, mm -hmm. what they end up doing is they're looking through a smaller and smaller pool of candidates mm -hmm. and the price of them the salary uh, of the candidates start going up because companies are competing with each other for those bad candidates right yeah. the pristine banana that looks with you know that has no blemish yeah but actually in reality it's a green banana it's not yeah. ripe it's not sweet it's not right at all but they're competing over that banana. Yeah, because right? it looks pretty. Because it looks pretty, exactly. Yeah. So what ends up happening there is for the entire industry, salaries go up. But then you've got the actually good ripe bananas and they know their worth. Mm. And they know actually if they're given a chance, they can outperform the green banana. Yeah. Right? So... Uh, those candidates will surf through the inflation of salaries, leverage yeah. that high salary, and absolutely smash it. Mm. And then they will they will go from strength to strength, right? So so they're going to be getting better and better salaries, better and better jobs, uh, particularly if they're capable of navigating and finding, let's say, some good managers. Some but this is, this is supposing, right? This is supposing that, again, we're uh, we'll pull back to, uh, a, a, you know, ASD or, a, or ADHD, right? This is this is on the supposition that that candidate uh, that has, you know, that, that has the blemishes, but is actually pristine in the middle. This is under the supposition that they know how to navigate uh, social interactions, that they know how to uh, interview well uh, or say the right things. And sure. I mean, what is the reality of this is um, a lot of ADHD people, this is stuff that they, they fundamentally struggle with. I, I can't tell you how many ADHDers really genuinely struggle with interviewing or picking up on sarcasm or in-office politics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Definitely. they get passed up. So I, I, I get what you're saying when it comes to that kind of small minority of bananas. But then we get to, um, let's say, the... I don't want to say the bigger majority of bananas, but the but the other bananas. Sure. So, that, so yeah, you see where I'm going. Yeah. So because the 
so I just wanted to make sure that the point is across that the mm. it, it creates a feedback loop, right? Bad management, low high raises the salary for everyone. So this is actually a good thing for for even neurodiverse individuals. But um, the the feedback loop is there because then they start looking, start narrowing. Because if they want to hire somebody at that high inflated price, yeah, they want to look for something that in their mind is worth that price. Yeah. So they start making the criteria smaller and smaller and smaller, the higher the inflation goes. Yeah. So so that's a feedback loop that is ever increasing. So it, let's say if tomorrow the price, the salary of a security architect hit 200K. Yeah. They're going to start looking for people with 10 years experience. Yeah, if not more, honestly. If not more, because they <laughs> think that that's what it should be. But yeah. then guess what? That's the price for people with two years experience. Yeah. And if you're looking for people with 10 years experience, right? The, what I'm calling the the banana that is ripe. Yeah. They're going to go, no, no, two years experience is worth that. I was worth that last year, but now there's yeah. inflation. I'm worth more. Yeah. Right. But then, but then it compounds a so, bit more as well, doesn't it? Because you're like although it's although you have the price inflation you have the wage inflation it compounds a little bit more because um oh I'm, i i had the thought in my head uh oh dang it i've lost it <laughs> oh man ADHD oh, no. tax. ADHD oh, tax. i was i was trying to listen and i was also trying to think like oh this is such a good point um oh i've got it, it i've got it. You've got it i've got it Brilliant. so it compounds because here, here here's the problem right uh let's say you have 10 years of experience great and you're worth 200k you're a security architect that's great um at the more junior levels uh let's say junior security en engineer or junior security ar uh, analyst not architect analyst um a lot of companies either don't want to invest in these junior people because they don't think they're going to stay for very long or they don't want to hire people with let's say one or two years of experience or even graduates because, I mean, it's it's cybersecurity, right? Like we, you, you guys are literally there to protect the infrastructure and the finances of these companies, blah, 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 of the, of the GDPR and everything, right? So then this comes into effect of, uh, oh, hey, we have this skills gap for mid to senior and uh, executive level roles, but you don't really have the skills gap because there's a lot of junior and mid-level people that yes. aren't being invested in and aren't getting the money that they deserve because the companies don't want to come in and say, oh, hey, uh, you have two years of experience. I'm going to give you more money. I'm going to promote you to a security engineer. I'm going to invest in you because yeah, so, I trust your ability. So, so it, here, it here's how it shows doesn't. up in the market. So mm. here's how it shows up in the market. It's beautiful. Researchers. HR uh, recruitment researchers have have done uh, um, what's the word surveys mm. for donkey's years now, seeing you know how many people are looking for jobs, yeah, and how many roles are currently available, and it has been demonstrated statistically there isn't a shortage of candidates issue, no. So employers that used to say there's not enough candidates. You know, we need to get more people into cyber. We need to get more people into cyber. We need to get, you know, so there were all of these plans to flood the market with, with candidates. And it's not solved the problem. It's made it worse. Yeah. So why now the analysis is starting to become, okay, well, there are enough candidates. So why is there still a shortage? And they've changed the word, Dean. Oh, it's a skills shortage. Yeah. It's no longer a candidate's shortage. It's a it's skills. A skill sh yeah. It's a skilled candidate shortage. So, so you mean you don't want to pay the price of, you don't want to pay the worth of the candidate. You want a more skilled candidate for the price that you're paying. Or That's you what it don't means. Want to, or you don't want to invest in the game. Because um, as a recruiter, right, I obviously, I speak to people such as yourself all day. And just one of the things I learned quite quickly um there are a lot of open security roles in the mid to senior level positions yes and there are particularly a lot, in the mid to senior level positions there are a lot of people that are really good for the role 
Um, but why are they not being hired? Well, I can tell you. It's because a lot of these people need uh, sponsorship or don't need sponsorship, but haven't worked in the UK. And the companies, for whatever reason, may want to may may not want to take that risk because they're like, oh, we don't know if they're going to be a good culture fit, blah, blah, blah. But they have the technical skills. So they say there's the skill shortage. And the, there was a report by, it was like Cyber News Weekly or something. I can't remember who it was. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, basically saying there's a reported, there's going to be a reported skills gap of like three and a half million cybersecurity professionals or yeah. jobs uh, in the entire world by 2025 or 2027. Well, it's not the case. I get contacted probably five to 10 times a week by graduate level security, uh, security. We have just graduates, cybersecurity graduates asking if I have roles. The issue isn't the candidates. The issue isn't the even a skills shortage. The issue in my mind is, a, is an unwillingness to invest in these people or to invest in the people that are, are, are nearly at that point, bring them up to mid to senior level and then train up and start entry level people. That's where the it's issue worse. is. It, it's worse than that um, because a lot of companies are not doing that because they think the the junior candidates are not worth their salary. Yeah. Right. But so it, it, they, if they are going to hire somebody at that salary, they want somebody a jack of all trades that can do everything. Yeah. So particularly in that junior to mid role, um, I've been there and you know got the t-shirt and I can tell you every time I used to apply for a junior to mid level role, they wanted a check of all trades for the price yeah. that they were paying. You know, um, I can't afford a June, a mid position, but yeah. that's what I need. Yeah. And a junior is not qualified enough to do what I want them to do. Yeah. So in order to justify paying somebody at a mid level position, I wanted to yeah. do both. Yeah. But here's the thing, right? And in starting to get into solutions now, um, what you find is a mismatch between, is always, every time, always a mismatch between what the worth of the candidate is mm. and how much the company is willing to pay for it. And a bad manager, instead of trying to find the diamond in the rough, yeah. right? Rather than try to find, let's say, lower prices, lower the salary offer, but find a diamond candidate within yeah. that price range, what they end up doing instead is because of the bull market. I remember the, the we started this with say it's part of the bull market. Yeah. They just ask executives, can we get a higher budget? Yeah. Can we get a higher budget? And so they start going up, but then the the, the, the company says for that price i want somebody with more experience but yeah. then the person with more experience is not going to want to do the job for that much they're going to want to do the job for more yeah. <laughs> and every time they go up it scales so how do you solve it there's three ways that it can be solved right um there are some let's say easy pickings and there are some more structural difficult mm. issues so the simple answer is just to pay people what they're worth and stop you know overestimating this idea that if you raise the salary you're going to find a better candidate yeah if you can't find the candidate at the salary that you've got the issue is with your metrics <laughs> not with the salary i don't know i think i would disagree on that one i've got um I've got I've got one role right now uh, for a client and genuinely the quality of the candidates I've been sending to them they 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 like right mm -hmm. they like the quality the problem is the quality that I'm sending is about 20k over budget uh, for what they're able to pay and yep. I've gone and I've said look you know the budget that you've given us uh, the budget that that you're willing to pay this is the quality candidate that, that, that you're going to get. And so I've sent candidates at that qual at that level saying this is this is what you're going to get for this quality for this. So, this so I've got a question for you. How do yeah. you know it's at that level? Uh, what metric are you using to measure? 
So the, the, the what to, to measure the candidates that, that I speak to? That you sent to them. How do okay. you know the candidate is a good fit? So I don't I don't base it on years of experience. Um, mm. Some some clients appreciate that. Some clients don't appreciate that. Uh, some candidates again appreciate that. Some don't. I don't care how many years of experience you have. How, in your how do you do it? I'm I'm getting to, I'm getting to work. <laughs> I I get it by I, I I talk to them right. I have uh, depending on the role I have a list of questions both technical and competency based that I ask my candidates. Um, let's say I, I I'm I'm working for a seam role. I'll be asking, can you tell me of a time that you were working on a configuration and it all went to hell and how did you fix it? Or if I'm working a digital forensics role, can you tell me about a time that there was an in, in, an incident or escalation? Again, it all went to hell. What did you do? Uh, what kind of remediation did you work on? What platforms did you use? Uh, what was your you know what was your process to find out why it went to hell in the first place? Then what was your process to remediate that? What were the tools that you used? Talk me through everything that you did. And right. so that's so, so let's that's break one that way. down. Yeah, I love this. I, I absolutely love this. So let's break that down. By asking those questions, what skills do you think you're assessing? So I'm first off, I'm assessing uh, whether or not they are interested, actually interested in the role, because if they don't want to tell mm -hmm. me in detail uh, about that. And I appreciate that there is obviously confidentiality that we have to go through. And so a lot of the times they can't tell me specific things that they've done. I get that, that's fine. But the first thing I'm, I'm assessing is, are they actually interested in this role? If they're willing to talk to me about it, cool. They're interested in the role. Perfect. Second thing, Interest. second thing I'm assessing is what they have on their CV. Does it line up to what I'm asking them? So if they can tell me in detail uh, about in an incident that they that they resolved or a seam configuration that they worked on. If they can tell me that in detail, then they are also telling me, cool, they were truthful on their CV. They're also telling me that they are technically capable and that they can back that up with real world examples. So I'm assessing. So, uh, so mm -hmm. you're measuring for experience. I am. I'm, <laughs> okay. So, so you see, here's the thing. No. There's a difference between years of experience and experience with a process. Yes, which so is I'm not, not measuring, necessarily a bad thing. I'm not measuring for years of experience so much as that I'm, I'm measuring for. Can you tell me? Can, can you can you demonstrate yeah. that you have experience in the tools that the, tool, this, the role, the processes, yeah. the best yes. practices? I don't care. I don't care if you've only done it for a year. If you can show so me measuring the knowledge. If you can show me that you have the knowledge and the tools and the capacity to do the job, I will be happy to send you. I don't Perfect. care if you've only been doing it for a year. But okay. then I'm also so assessing. How do you know mm. they're doing they're doing it well? That's the thing. This is the thing is um, as a recruiter. I am not I'm as much as recruiters say we you know, we like to say oh, I'm a specialist in uh security recruitment yeah yeah i'm a specialist in infrastructure software developer development i don't work in i don't use miter and attack i don't yes. use i don't use splunk so it means you understand the market not necessarily cyber security itself i understand the market and i understand enough of what you guys do that i can get a baseline understanding uh uh, or like maybe let's call it like a like a soft competency baseline mm -hmm. but i ca i can't technically assess in the way that a hiring manager can or in the way that an advisory board can so they're worse by the way yeah but, but, but <laughs> that's what i'm saying is like what you've described but, is better than many hiring managers i'm telling you that now but there, there's only so much that i can do as a recruiter but in what i'm able to do i try to do my due diligence uh, obviously, mm -hmm. some yeah. people you know get through the cracks, and if they get through the cracks, hats off to them. They that means so they they're a good interviewer. Let me let me blow your mind now. That's so here. the the true diamond in the rough that you're going to find mm. is when you find somebody with a skill set without experience in that matter, in the subject matter. Yeah. They, these is ten, generally called transferable skills. 
Would you which find somebody soft skills, if you will? Not soft skills, transferable skills, even technical mm -hmm. skills. So let's say, you know, um, you want to have somebody that is a forensic investigator, mm -hmm. but they don't have experience in forensics or forensic tooling. But guess what? They've done a year in SOC. They've been a junior SOC analyst. Yeah. You know, they, they don't have a lot of experience. They've worked with some SOC tools. They've done a few investigations, but certainly nothing, you know, that they can, ex, you know, talk extensively about. How would you measure their ability to do mm. forensics? So I've, I've had this actually, uh, I, I've actually had this, uh, quite proud of this one. Um, although the, the, the person you should be, the, job, the, the person get the job. Exactly. Exactly. Which, which was really annoying, right? which was really, really annoying. But you're starting um, to touch the, on the point now. Exactly. So on, this person, on. this person, uh, was a threat hunter. Um, yep. they've, they've been doing, oh, I love threat hunters. Yeah. They, they've been, they've been, uh, They've been a threat hunter for for years and years and years. Uh, now they are at their current place. They are a uh, a threat team lead, so they're running yeah. a, yeah. a a team of I think it's like five or six uh, threat analysts. Absolutely awesome. I put them forwards for a digital forensics and incident response position. Their CV didn't have much in the way of, D of DFIR at all. Yep. So how did I measure and figure out that? you know, or think that they were good for the role. To be completely honest, I, I don't know. They, mm -hmm. A part yeah. of it was a gut feeling. Yes. Genuinely, okay. a right. part of it was a gut feeling. I was talking to them. I have a, I have a relationship with this person. I, I know them decently well, um, as well as I can without ever having met them. But you know what I mean? Um, yes, of course. And from the conversations that I'd had and knowing the kind of person that they were, I just had this gut feeling of, I know they're going to be good. I, I know they're good enough to to get through technical, but maybe they're not going to be good enough for exactly what the the company is looking no. for. Fine, but it was let me run feeling. that by you. Yeah, the I job of a good man. No, no, no. That's fine. Uh, I, I I know because I do the same. <laughs> so the the difference between a good and a bad manager is the ability to quantify structuralize systemic um to to systemize no there's a proper word for that systematize systematize that's the word systematize that gut feeling into operationable metrics right yeah. so what you perceived through your pattern detection mechanisms right instinctive yeah. pattern detection mechanisms uh, there are some really smart people out there. Yeah. They're capable to take uh, what this is generally called art and turn it into science. Uh, to take know, the art and turn it into science. So here's the trick. Problem solving ability. I was going to say, one. you know what the, you know what this candidate, uh, you know what this candidate has in common? ADHD. ADHD. Of course, ADHD are pattern detection machines. Look, so problem solving ability, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, the um, pattern detection mechanisms, the ability to perceive and identify patterns. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter whether they are threat hunting patterns or whether they are forensic patterns. Yeah the ability to follow a system in a methodological fashion, right? So, yeah. and, and generally all of these things tend to be somewhat associated with IQ. And when you're talking about uh, psychometrics, so the, the, the measurement of personality, mm. the most trusted nowadays uh, personality measurements is called the big five. The big so, five the big five personality test. So these okay. covers things like extroversion, um, openness, so openness to experience, the willingness mm -hmm. to try out new things, um, 
conscientiousness, which usually means how organized you are or how hardworking you are. Uh, neuroticism, which generally is your aversion to threat, right? So your if it, how risk adverse you are, right? Yeah. And how emotionally invested you are to risk detection. And um, what's the third one? So you've got extraversion, openness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and oh, I forgot the other one. Uh, give me two seconds. I literally can Google this in. in <laughs> What, what, I, what I'm what I'm hearing what I'm hearing is agreeableness. A lot, a lot of these traits, right. a lot of these traits are traits that neurodiverse people have. Um, no, every, everybody has them, but then like it's it's like a spectrum. It's a personality spectrum. Okay, let, they, let me rephrase. Yeah. Let me rephrase that. Then yeah. um, a lot of the traits that you're talking about, I think ADHD or neurodiverse people maybe show uh, to a higher extent. Like um, ADHDers on, on on the whole are more risk tolerant so correct lower neuroticism yes i i picked up and moved from the us to the uk with hardly a second thought i literally was like okay i'm gonna sell my car everything i own i'm just gonna pick up i'm gonna move and it's gonna figure itself out i think very wow. few <laughs> neurotypical people would do that you're right whether or not that's a good trait is up for debate but it's something that's that I because do. of object permanence yeah. So in ADHD, the lack of object permanence, the fact that you forget things easily, right? It yeah. means you don't remember risks as pretty much as permanently as as yeah. neurotypical people. So, so yes. maybe <laughs> maybe a way maybe a way to address the the economic impact of uh, of bad management um, and neurodiversity is. What, let's say we, we bring more neurodiverse people into not we, I'm not saying that we have to bring them in that, as managers that specifically that won't um, change things well what I'm saying is in cybersecurity you have a preponderance of autistic and ADHD managers I know but and what that I'm saying has is like not solved the problem that's let's made bring it worse. them in let's bring them into let's bring them into the into the hiring process right so let's say we have a neurotypical hiring manager and that neurotypical hiring manager is like oh okay um, this is what I, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. And then let's say I put five CVs in front of the neurotypical manager and let's let's just presuppose one of them is going to get the job, right? No matter what, one of them is going to get the job and the five CVs are all different qualities. Um, they, they all match or don't match for what, for varying reasons. Now, the hiring manager might go for the shiniest CV um, because let's, again, let's presuppose the neurotypical. They might go for the shiniest CV and say, ah, they all the buzzwords are there, blah, blah, blah. Great. Mm. Now let's take a neurodiverse person in, um, wh whether ASD doesn't matter or ADHD doesn't matter. And we give that, that, that person the same five CVs. There is a chance that they would look at a CV that isn't pretty. Uh, maybe the, the candidate is a bit jumpy. They've moved every nine months to a year or something they don't have as much technical information on their cv or maybe they have too much they've waffled it too much right but they have that level of intuition on that cv that the neurotypical hiring man manager doesn't so what what then could happen well that neurodivergent person could then go to the hiring manager and say hey i know you like candidate a but candidate d here they are really good and this is why, but you have to be able to quantify that and break that down and have that relationship with that hiring manager. That, that maybe, maybe I'm convoluting it way too much. No, I think there's a lot of assumptions uh, in the sense there's the assumption there that the neurodiverse person will always 100% of the time be better at detecting a diamond in the rough than the neurotypical. Yes, yeah, that that is an assumption. That, um, yeah, it's an assumption it's, that's it, made. It, that's the thing. It's an us versus them approach, which is not going to make things better. You it's see, not, not this idea that an, a neurodiverse person is going to mm. be always better at the job. So that's. But I'm not saying. I'm not. Sorry, I, I'm not trying to take an us versus them approach. I'm trying to find an approach of how can how can we how can we as neurodivergent people work with neurotypical people uh, to help solve this problem. Ignore the label. Systematize. That's, that's the solution. Just ignore neurodivergent, neurotypical. Just ignore the labels. No, 
in the sense of the label won't be the differentiating factor mm -hmm. when it comes to hiring or promoting yeah. or retaining. Because here's the thing. A neurodiverse manager is just as likely to drive an employee into resigning as a neurotypical that's, yeah. manager. Yeah, right? that's true. So, um, and they're just <clears throat> as easy, you know, just as easily misled when it comes to identifying the right candidate. Because you, you said it earlier, you know, that gut feeling. Now, some neurodiverse people have that gut feeling, some don't. Yeah. Some neurotypical people have that gut feeling, some don't. How do you solve the problem? You take the gut feeling and you systematize it so that everybody can do it. Yeah, but how do you quantify or systematize something that is, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Easy. easy. That's why I was saying the personality traits. Oh, this is where you're going with it. Okay, I see where you're saying. That's where I was going. Yes, so you have to find, for example, you want to find a hard worker, mm. conscientious people, and their tests done with this repeatedly ad nauseum, people that have, are high in conscientiousness are known to work harder. It's so a you fact, want, it's so statistical you fact. To, what, so you, you would want to test candidates with this personality test? It's the most successful personality test in psychology ever. Uh, and, and it's being developed even further. They say now there's even a, 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 a big six model with H being honesty, right? Uh, as, a, as an additional factor to it. Right. So here's the thing. If you want somebody to be creative, if, you, if you're hiring for a creative role, openness. You want somebody high in openness, happy to experience new things. But you, you, but there you're having to presuppose that the candidates are going to be willing to take this uh, the, to take this test. A hundred percent, I know, I know for a fact that that is a factor. But this is one way of let's say solving the problem. Now, yeah. if you don't want the, you know, if you don't want the candidates to take these tests, you can narrow them down. As part of an interview process, you can ask them during your interview. Oh, and just kind of create like an internal scoring like system. Right. IQ. Oh. What, what does IQ, what does intelligence quotient measure? Do you well, know? Supposedly, yes, but it, supposedly it, it, it measures the, well, just what the innate intelligence of someone or their ability to Not problem solve. Problem solve. Yeah, exactly. Supposedly. The, it, it measures two things pattern detection and problem solving. So your ability to visualize a solution to a contextual problem instinctively. So how quickly does your brain process the problem? How quickly it processes a simulation to identify a given solution? And how quickly you pattern match a solution on paper to the solution in your mind, right? So uh, most IQ tests, you're given a question, which is the problem. And you have to embed that problem into your brain and simulate it. And then you're given a set of multiple choice answers and your brain will come up with the answer. And then you have to pattern match from the multiple choice, the answer that your brain came up with. That's how IQ tests work. So at the end of the day, at least that's the culture fair version, right? The culture oh. fair being the, the images and uh, yeah. geometric shapes one. And you're like, you're, you're identifying rotation. So you've got, so, you know, a clock at 12, a clock at three, a clock at six. And then he asks you, what's the next one in the sequence? A clock nine. At nine. Yeah, exactly. So that you have to be able to imagine the problem, which is the rotation of the clock. You've got the sequence. Mm. And then, so um, that that's what it's measuring. So if you want somebody in a job that is an engineering job. You want to be looking for someone that has that same kind of intellectual acumen, if you will. Yeah, the ability to yeah. problem solve, to engineer, to looking, simulate. Yeah. yeah, whereas if you're looking for someone uh, for like a GRC role, you'd be looking for, well, you wouldn't be looking for the same thing. You'd be looking for totally No, you'd different. be looking for somebody that's conscientious. Yeah. Potentially a little bit neurotic because you want them to be risk adverse. Yeah. Right? So, so that's, 
No, so so I was I was thinking about this while we we're talking, and I I think you've actually addressed. Uh, I basically had a question. I think you've actually addressed it because there there are different types of um, intellect, if you will, right? You have logical yes. intellect, emotional intellect, psychological impact uh, yes. intellect, um, social 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 intellect, intellect uh, even physical intellect, where um, you know you, you're intellectually maybe you're not as smart in the smart, but you but know you're good visual and kinesthetic. Yes. Yeah, you're kinesthetically intellectual. Um, I was, uh, that was going to be my rebuttal, but it, it seems like you've actually thought this through, where if you have an engineer, you're going to be looking for one type of intellect because that's Correct. the thing that engineers need, whereas if you're looking yes, for a team, you need to match the intelligence yeah. to the role. You can't pick somebody that is a, a, a beautiful artist. Yeah. But like They are an amazing musician. They have a high IQ and they have uh, their high in openness. And yeah. then they're gonna try to do a GRC role. Yeah, or like a pen right? testing role. Yeah, they'd, 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 yeah, they'd hate it. <laughs> right, they, they'd hate it. it you know, it, yeah. it's not open enough for, for them. It's not creative enough. Yeah. Um, so it's too procedural, right? Yeah. So, so that's the thing. You need to match the role to the candidate. And sometimes experience not just years of experience, but experience yeah. with a particular tool, particular yeah. process, is not the best predictor of capacity to do that job. So yeah. what you had with your gut feeling is you identified in that candidate an ability to do pattern detection, an ability to problem solve, a particularly maybe a, a, a heightened conscientiousness, the ability to, to be very right. dedicated to the job. Somebody might be a quick learner, and if you're capable of assessing during an interview how quick a learner somebody is, give them a case, right? And don't give them yeah. time to prepare. Surprise them with a case study during the interview and see how quickly they will remember the facts of that case study. Hmm. That's somebody's ability to learn. So this, this is kind of, yeah, so this is kind of your solution to it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's. I'm saying you need to systematize the hiring yeah. process because decades, uh, a whole generation of bad managers have killed the yeah. hiring industry. They've killed the science behind hiring. They've yeah. really killed it. And and you can use the same thing for performance and promotion. You know, somebody's on the job, and you need to you know, you, you need a new manager rather than giving it to the person that's been in the company the longest, you need to give it to the person potentially with a higher agreeableness. Yeah. Because a disagreeable person is not a good manager. Yeah. Right. Well, true, disagreeable yeah. people make good directors, yeah. very good directors. But they don't make good managers. Yeah. They can't, they don't they, make they, good they can't managers. empathize. They, yeah. They can't they work can't well with others. Yeah. Correct. So, yeah. so you see the idea. So, like, you need to find the right skill set for the role, and you need to find ways to measure that skill set. Yeah. And and that's what's been missing. That's why neurodiverse people are losing out. That's why neurotypical people are losing out. That's why companies are losing out on a lot of money. Right. Yeah. The whole economic system is broken because of this fact. Poor measurement of of productivity. Right. Yeah. So, so that's when it comes to, to personal management and companies need a whole lot better outcome measurement, yeah. outcome measurement when it comes to like productivity. How do you know if somebody is being productive? You know, the, the traditional approach, how many hours have you done yeah. a day? If that yeah, doesn't mean that you're being many, productive. Have, it's like in recruitment, how many calls have you made today? Oh, how many calls 20. have you made today? It's like, oh, yeah, but how many... okay, you haven't been productive today. Like, yeah, but how many candidates did you successfully place in a job? Ah, yeah. Or, <laughs> See, how that's many, the difference. Yeah. or it's like how You've, many how many calls were actually, uh, you know, how many calls connected, or how many calls um, did you actually get something out of? Like, how many people yes. of those twenty were interested in the role, a good fit, um, yes. match the salary? You, they, they 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 actually they, it could be could produce see. results. Call to call to offer yeah. uh, ratio so yeah your call to offer ratio is your performance so not not even that it's um i i, I go off of um interview to, to to offer ratio 
Um, well, even even tighter. Yeah, even I try, tighter. I try to be very tight. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, interview to offer ratio is how you know once you've got an interview set up, what's the percentage of those interviews that result in an offer? They, I don't know off the top of my head. No, no, I know. I'm not asking. I'm saying oh, right, right, that right. is a good measurement for productivity. Yeah, because you can you can mathematically calculate how good you are at finding the right candidate. But that can be gamed, you see. That can be gamed, let's say, by sending less candidates into interviews. Yeah. But if you're really good at selecting, if that gut feeling of yours is really good at pre-selecting the right candidate, then you know that this candidate will be successful. Yeah. So you send less. So you're boosting your ratio. <laughs> right <laughs> but um, okay. so, so so you can see so every metric has its way to be gamed but at the very least it's a metric that is measured on the basis of uh something productive uh, yeah you know if the company made an offer that means they liked the candidate so it's undeniably a good outcome yeah so even if you can game the ratio the outcome is still good Right? Yeah. But then you've got companies that make some measurements that are ineffective, that lead to bad outcomes. Oh, they're arbitrary measurements at best. Arbitrary at yeah. best, outright disruptive at worst. Yeah. And people are smart. Employees are smart. They'll learn to game the measurements. They'll yeah. learn to game the metrics. And now they're gaming the metrics that are irrelevant arbitrary at best so you're teaching employees to become more arbitrary Jeez. so why why else would we have a stagflation why would productivity be low yeah if you're not all training sudden, employees all of a sudden it comes around circle of course it does yeah and this is what game theory teaches you see so once you start identifying this is okay managers um being bad managers, they're measuring your productivity with the wrong metric. Yeah. And now you'll see a lot of articles saying, oh, employees are lazy. Are they? Or have you trained them to game the wrong metrics? Yeah. <laughs> so and, like, and, you're, and you're measuring them on the wrong metrics, not on the, you're me measuring on them the metrics. On yeah, you're not measuring them on things that matter. You're measuring them on things that someone put in place to make themselves feel more important while having to do less work. Yes, and here's the thing. <laughs> Productivity at the country level or at the company level is measured appropriately, roughly, right? GDP and, and monetary values are a good measure of, of success. Sure. But here's the thing. How does your team, your individual team performance, correlate to how much profit your company makes. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can't prove that the metric you're using for your team actually, actually increases the, the yeah. profits yeah. by either lowering cost or boosting revenue, yeah. your metric is irrelevant. <laughs> it's literally that simple. Oh, I think we're going to have some upset people at the end of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's the truth, you know, blaming employees for being Jocko Willink created a beautiful book, Extreme Ownership. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I'm sure no. uh, some people listening to this podcast would know. Extreme Ownership is brilliant. It, and basically every manager that tries to, or every executive, every CEO, director that tries to blame employees for being lazy or less productive. Mm. particularly around this conversation about working from home, right? Oh, we want employees back in the office because they're less productive when they're working from home. Let that book, Extreme Ownership, be a lesson. The buck ends with the accountable executive. <laughs> every oh. time. Every time. I didn't so, know there were accountable executives. No. Well, <laughs> great point. <laughs> exactly. So oh. the idea is if your employees are being less productive, maybe you're not measuring productivity correctly. Yeah. Maybe you're not measuring incentive correctly, right? Because there's the idea as well. Are, how are you incentivizing people to be more productive? 
Yeah, but then that would mean right. if you're not measuring that correctly, then you're also not measuring your hiring needs on what you actually need, but on what you think exactly. you exactly. Yeah, right. So yeah. and then who suffers even more? Neurodiverse people. Yeah, right. Because we're now being managed by bad managers. And. They are. Not happy with us yeah. because we're not that social. You know, or maybe we're too social, or maybe we're grumpy because we're measuring us badly. Or we're taking and, it too literally, but you're telling us what to do and we're doing it very literally. Yeah. So, so yeah. all of these things, and then uh, we end up getting the short end of the stick and being fired. Yeah. Because the manager can't measure productivity well, they can't measure hiring skills well, yeah. they can't, right? So, that is the key. So once a, a good manager that is capable of measuring things correctly, mm. they will go to a low salary. They'll make a, they, they'll open a role yeah. at a lower salary and they'll have the cream of the crop of candidates. Yeah. Because here's what they're going to do. They're not going to me measure the candidate skill on the basis of experience or knowledge on with a particular tool they're going to measure the candidate on the basis of actual measurable metrics to find if they're a good fit to that role yeah. you know um what's their iq roughly uh what's uh, you know their conscientiousness how hard working are they going to be yeah. um how good are they at problem solving how good are they at um pattern detection, how good are they at learning? How fast a learner are they? Yeah. And then you're gonna find, actually, there are some really good candidates here that don't have that experience. Yeah, but that they would have otherwise missed had they not done it that way. But yeah. within three weeks, they've learned. Yeah. They've learned, like, it's literally that quickly. Three weeks, they learn how to use the tool. Yeah. Three weeks, they learn how to detect patterns that they had never seen before. Yeah, well, Gabriel, I uh, we, I think we've run out of time for this, um, but I do genuinely believe that we could um, <laughs> that we could be talking about this for hours yet. Uh, yes. So it would it would be definitely be good to to get you back on uh, at, at at a later point, and we can just keep going into this. But in no, the... I think we're we're reaching the end, anyways. Yeah. So you know the the three the three main solutions are better hiring and recruitment, better performance yeah. management, and you know, productivity monitoring and people management training. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, it's it's no, you know, it's it's good enough. Well, not good enough. Like, yes, okay, you can measure an engineer productivity. You can measure an analyst productivity. But yeah. how are you going to measure management productivity? Yeah. So you need good people management training and a good way of assessing their skills. Yeah. Uh, within their role. And and train them to do better. Train them to yeah. do better. Train them on how to handle neurodiverse employees. If you've got a neurodiverse manager, then train them so that they can handle, you know, things despite being neurodiverse. Yeah. They can manage better. Yeah. Everybody needs training. Everybody. Everybody needs training. Completely agree on that. I need training. You need training. Every we we do. Yes. It is just something that yeah. Yeah, there's we all have something to learn every day. It, it's it doesn't stop. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really well uh, summarized. Um, yeah, you know, I, we, we've it's a really, really complex subject. I don't it maybe is. we haven't maybe we haven't solved anything. Um, maybe we have hopefully <laughs> we have. All I can hope is that the people that have been listening have gotten something out of it. Um, but yeah, thank you uh, to everyone that's been listening or watching. Thank you guys for listening to Hyper Focus Hour. Uh, which has been hosted by myself, obviously, and uh, Gabriel here through via resource, which again, we are a recruitment company. So if you need us, I'm right here. Um, Gabe, thank you so much for your time today, for your wonderful insights on neurodiversity, management, and the economy. Uh, you have a lot of thoughts into it. You've obviously put a lot of time and effort into it. It's been amazing getting, getting to hear you. Uh, to, just wonderful to get the challenges on my ideas, my presuppositions. It's, it's been really informative and I just really, really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, thank you again. And for everyone else, stay tuned for the next episode. 
don't forget to take a break, drink some water, and uh, yeah, take a take a stand up and walk around for a few minutes. Until next time. Okay. Stop recording.